Good morning, everyone. Great to see so many of you here today uh, for this event, which I hope is going to be thought-provoking. Um, we want your ideas as well. So uh, we will start with setting the stage, but then we'll move into some panel discussions and interactions. So we're excited about today. Um, and I have a long set of instructions here that I know I'm going to mess up. Um, but on my first task, I will not, um, because I don't need um, a set of instructions to introduce our first speaker here today, um, because uh, I would like to share a few things about him that you don't know about Googling him. Um, and so just to, to introduce uh, our framing discussion around um, elegantly designing. Um, the future. And then after Luca uh, opens up with uh, the book, which I hope you have taken uh, on your way in. Uh, good morning, did Dr. G come in? Yes. Um, we will go into a more detailed uh, panel discussions with our own speakers from the university. Um, Dean Robinson and Dean Martinelli will introduce our next speakers. And then Paul Fisher will help us also in the introduction and helping us frame the discussion with additional questions and giving us an update of what we do here at Sydney Hall University. Before we start, I just saw Dr. G, in addition to our two deans, I see also Dean Strasser here in the audience and other members of the administration. Thank you for being here with us and our faculty from, and guests and alumni and the chair of the faculty senate and faculty development. Thank you, Dr. Bakken, to be here. Um, but I also want to announce a special speaker here with us today. Not speaker, sorry, a, spe a special guest, all the way from Lyon. I mean, yes, this talk was so famous that we got guests uh, all the way from the other side of the ocean. Uh, dean Olivier Meillard from Catholic de Lyon. He is the dean of the business school at Catholic de Lyon, and he's accompanied by uh, Associate Dean Kevin Pond, who is Associate Dean for <clears throat> Accreditation, he doesn't want that to be known, and Internationalization. So we have spent a great uh, morning um, session this morning thinking about international programs and what else can we do um, talking about education and, and student exchanges. So thank you for being here. And I'm delighted to see the light of day of this book that I had the pleasure to read when it was still in the making. Um, and to introduce Luca, because uh, there is a lot to say about Luca uh, that you can read on, by Googling, you know, something like uh, a Fulbright at the MIT Media Lab, um, background in uh, visiting professor at Stevens, uh, professor in uh, Università Napoli Partenope, and uh, degrees from uh, in electrical engineering and then systems engineering, Università di Roma Tor, Ber Tor Bergata, and so on and so forth. But your, what you will not see about Luca is that he's also a competitive volleyball player, the very famous Serie C in Italy. He's also a musician. In his spare time, he's an historian, a photographer, um, and so on and so forth. And that, it's very interesting because by training, he's an engineer. But he's an engineer that has an holistic view. So uh, when, I, when I had the pleasure to work with Luca, um, I remember that I always looked at what is the most complex problem that I have? Let's give it to Luca. Because if we have to think about, well, how do we design a new master in cybersecurity, that's difficult because you need to bring people together. You'll give it to Luca, you'll break it into pieces, and then he'll reassemble them together like a masterpiece, a piece of art. And that's what it does, and that's what I think you've also been doing with your book, bringing some principles from engineering into the art and giving us a framework to think about things. So um, without further ado, Luca, thank you. Thank you so much, Katya. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. So. I just want to add to this wonderful presentation that the reason why you don't find these things if you Google me is because I try to hide them. <laughs> uh, because those things are not the, the best things I've ever done. But of course, I have a lot of fun. And uh, thanks, Kadia, for making that public. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so yeah, I'm, I want to share something about, uh, give you some uh, um, overview of what this book is about, and uh, also how the book goes a little bit beyond the specific topic. You see on the title is, uh, is a book on design, but the way we, we look at design in this book, me and my co-author, Giuseppe Zolo from University of Naples, uh, is uh, in, in a very broad sense, is uh, as a form of problem solving that is driven by aesthetic reasoning. And that's actually a big part of the book. Uh, uh, and uh, in order for you um, to have a, an initial idea what the book is about and what is, I'm trying to advance this. Thank you. So I have a, I have a couple of pictures. Um, the book is full of visuals, uh, as you can see if you have a copy in front of you. But basically, <clears throat> you know, these are two pictures that have uh, a, a similar uh, subject. It's uh, they have been taken uh, during the first Gulf War, 1991. Uh, as you remember, uh, probably one of the things that Saddam Hussein did to retaliate uh, during the war was to put uh, the oil wells on fire. So this is what the picture is about. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if I, if I make a poll in this room uh, and ask uh, to all of you, you know, which one do you prefer, most of you, uh, I think a very large majority, would prefer uh, the picture by Salgado. And, uh, and of course, this is subjective. You might have different preference. But normally, most people prefer this one. And the reason is uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up is because I want to uh, share with you this key message, that is the, one of the key messages in the book, which is basically um, the idea that effective human communication is such when we are able to transfer a lot of meaning with less information, or as least uh, information as possible, as less information as possible. So this idea of compressing information and reducing the information that we need to transfer to make our uh, message uh, go through, uh, that's what we try to achieve. And that's what we mean by elegance in this, in this book. Uh, so uh, this is what I, what I want to cover uh, a little bit um, about aesthetic reasoning. So the, the, another uh, uh, premise uh, or maybe more of an argument in the book is that uh, most of our reasoning and decision making actually is either uh, determined or informed by aesthetic motivation or aesthetic criteria. Uh, so why is that? How we got it? Um, and then the core of the book is really about uh, this idea, how do we achieve that, um, that elegant communication uh, through design. And we, we, we think that we can learn this from artists. The way they package information is unique in this sense. And uh, uh, we frame elegance as a form of good complexity. And I'll, be, I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about this later. And then in, in more practical terms, what the book offers is, is a collection of uh, design uh, heuristics, uh, or uh, think of them as problem-solving heuristics. This is very broad and can be applied to a variety of problems that we base on art and science, and of course we provide a number of, of examples uh, of their application. So why, why we think aesthetically? Uh, for a number of reasons, I'm not going to cover all of this, uh, it be too much time, but um, you know, these are some, some key reasons. Uh, for instance, uh, one reason we need, uh, we need uh, aesthetic reasoning is uh, as a way to compress information. Um, then we need simple rules to predict events, typically based on naive physics, which is an intuitive understanding of the world, um, how the world works and functions. Uh, of course, pattern recognition, because we need to reuse this knowledge, this visual knowledge, and we apply it to recurring uh, instances of, of you know, that event. Uh, and then finally to make a decision and choose when uh, information is not enough and more importantly is ambiguous, so has multiple meanings. Uh, and all of this is the product of, of evolution, basically. That's what I learned by writing this book. Um, and uh, I also want to wanna specify what I mean with aesthetic in this book. I really refer to the original meaning of the word, uh, which is also the broader meaning, the broader meaning, which is basically everything that, per that pertains to the senses or the knowledge that we get through the senses that we process through our brain. Um, 
And the other thing that we say at the, at, the, at the very end is more of a, of a reflection, of a concern, is that you know, if you look at this task and wh why we think aesthetically and what we do with aesthetic thinking, a lot of these things we are delegating to increasingly so, to algorithms, to machines, to devices, so we, we probably are at a loss here. So we need to think about also in terms of, uh, I think, from, from our point of view as educators, you know, how to make sure that this loss doesn't, doesn't take place or how we can contain that loss. Of course, there's a lot of convenience with digital technology. I don't want to be, uh, you know, backward, but we have to, you know, there are pros and cons. And one of the cons is that we might lose some of the skills. So uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how aesthetic reasoning works. Um, so first of all, compress information. Uh, if you think about, Maybe you don't think about it because we could, we could not. We could not function if we, if we would think about it. So there's a, just a huge amount of information that every second eats our senses and to our senses, our brain. Um, of course, we have a, a, an enormous capacity of processing this information. The complexity of the system is, is really, really high. So these numbers give you an idea of you know, the amount of information that we need to, to cope with, to process. And as you can see also, most of this processing is visual. Either if it's visual, meaning that you know, obtain it through, through our eyes, or visual in terms of visual thinking. So, um, an example of how this works is uh, how we uh, is, is basically by information compression. So, one thing that we do is to aggregate this information. It's our brain that does that into higher level aesthetic percepts, like you know, ages, color, shapes, uh, shades, um, and this is one uh, output of of a an ability that our brain has of granularized information at a very different uh, level. Um, to illustrate this concept, I have, you, uh, I have an example for you here. So this is, uh, can, you, can you recognize anything in this, this image? You see anything in it? Uh, rock. So, uh, you know, the first thing to notice is that we want to see something in it. So we, we're, not, we're not happy with saying there's nothing in there. We want to see something. We try to, we, yeah, yeah this, this is what we do. This is how our brain works. So, um, and whatever we see, it's, it's okay as long as, you know, we are able to find some sense in, the, in, in this chaos, in this uh, absence of structure. Now, if I zoom out uh, a little bit, at this point, you understand that that is just, just a little uh, detail of a painting. It's a couple of brush strokes uh, over there. And then maybe you recognize the painting at this point <coughs> by Renoir. Uh, so the question is, you know, do we see that little piece? Do we see that detail? Uh, and the answer is, uh, is yes. Yes, we do. Uh, not necessarily are conscious of it, uh, but we do. And, and the way our brain uh, works, to help us to not be paralyzed of, of all that huge amount of information. You know, imagine to focus on every single uh, square inch of this painting. We will lose sense of the whole uh, meaning of the painting. But we don't. We, we recognize the scene. We actually might enjoy it. Uh, we see the, actually it's very complex scenes because there's so many characters and so much going on in that scene, people dancing, having fun. Nevertheless, you know, <clears throat> we are able to uh, workable levels because our, our brain kind of move along this continuum of very high level granular, granular information, intermediate and very small level. Um, and this is an aesthetic ability that we, we are born with. Uh, another example I have, uh, this is kind of fun, I do this all the time with my student. So uh, do you, do you, what is this? Do you see anything in this? Can you see anything? Yeah? What else? So normally when I show these this images to students, you know, we have a little bit of fun and people see the, the most different things in it. Uh, and uh, some people see different things. Some people cannot see what other people see. But what, what they have in common, all, all of these guesses, is that we, again, we try to see something in it. And what we look for uh, into this image is visual. It's not numbers, it's not words, it's not other type of information. We look for, for visual most of the time. And uh, um, I can tell you that I can see a cowboy there. 
on a horse. All right, now, now, now when I tell you, most of you will see it. Some people won't see, no worry, if you don't see this, it's okay, it's not a psychological or anything. Uh, it's just a game. Uh, but you know, uh, the point I wanna make, so anyway, this is the cowboy. So normally when I ask the students, how did you see the cowboy, most of them would tell me, oh, I saw the hat. Uh, actually, when uh, we did uh, this with your students, Kevin, uh, they said it in French, le chapeau. So I said, okay, the hat, because the hat with a cowboy, the hat is a very distinctive element of, of, a, of a cowboy. And then our minds say, okay, if there's a hat, there must be a cowboy. And as a cowboy, there must be a horse, because that's the kind of prototype, prototypical image. And then you, you start scanning. I, I've never done this systematically or empirically, but I think if I do it, if we do it, probably we will find that kind of regular pattern of exploration. Uh, and most people would, would see the cowboy in this image, because you start from a detail, and then your mind has a model of what a cowboy looks like, and you're just trying to confirm that the cowboy is there by looking for other elements that are predictive of a cowboy being there. Uh, so this helps us to decide with ambiguity. So when we don't know what things are, this is just a bunch of uh, black stains on a white background. We try to connect the dots visually, and we try to come up with an answer. Um, so how we got it? Uh, honestly, this, writing this book was such an intellectual journey. I had a lot of fun and a lot of reading, of course, I had to do, because uh, as Katya mentioned, it, my background is, is, is from another field, so I had to learn a lot in terms of aesthetic and uh, psychology of perception, and then biology. And this book uh, stuck with me because it was one of the most, uh, not only interesting, but also fun reading that I, that I did. Uh, so Richard Pram is a biologist, and he, uh, uh, the question he asked, what, why beauty exists in nature, in the animal world specifically? And you know, this is a paradox of the uh, Darwin's theory, uh, because in, a, in the, the fitness theory, uh, Darwin could not explain why, for instance, peacock have that huge tail, right? Why, why do they have it? It's not functional. If anything, it's an impediment to any kind of functional behavior, like running or you know, escaping predators. Uh, because that, that, you know, is a huge thing, very heavy, it doesn't help you to fly, to do anything, except impress your, uh, the girl of your dream, right? Um, and that's, that's what it is, that's what Pram says. Uh, beauty has just one function. He kind of criticized the theory of uh, beauty as a uh, honest uh, signal, meaning, you know, some beautiful traits are associated with some kind of um, uh, exceptional or superior performance, like, I don't know, long legs are beautiful because you can run faster. Now, there's no strong evidence. The evidence is problematic, has never been proved. Although there's a lot of papers that say that it's true, but Prum makes an analysis, say, no, this is not true, it's problematic. Nobody really has proved that some be beautiful traits are associated with some kind of superior performance. So he said, the only explanation I find uh, more convincing is this that basically beauty is self-referential. We look for those traits because we want descendants who have those traits, who are appreciated by others, and so they can reproduce themselves more, uh, more likely. Um, which, uh, I'm not a biologist, I'm not really interested in this particular aspect of evolution, but for me, uh, what stuck with me was this idea that beauty is arbitrary. And this is a big message, however, what also stuck with me was the beauty might be arbitrary, but it's not random. It's never random. We, we're not going to find beautiful something that is a completely random. Our, our mind abhors uh, a randomness. And um, this is an example of what he talks about in, in a book. He also talks about uh, a lot about uh, how birds have sex. I don't know if you're interested in the topic. It's very funny. Uh, but this is, uh, this is more about courtship, and courtship is uh, behavior of this particular bird, Bower Bird. He builds this kind of a very articulated and aesthetically interesting display, collecting things, pairing colors. This is not a nest, this is nothing functional. This is just to impress the lady. And so when she finds that you know, the, the person has a sophisticated sense of aesthetic, she might decide to, to, to mate uh, him for, for life. Um, now, with humans, uh, it, we, we brought it to the next level, of course, because uh, we add imagination to this, to all of this. And uh, the ability to think uh, uh, about things that don't really exist, ob objectively speaking. Um, so 
I found this connection with the, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you have read Sapiens. Uh, I think uh, he made a very good point when he said that this ability to abstract and to think imaginatively gave us, gave us as a species a lot of um, um, advantages. And uh, I see these advantages in, in the first example of ours that we know of, uh, so cave paintings. And most of the time, the, the, you have those scenes of hunting with many, many people uh, around collaborating with for this effort. And uh, the advantages that um, I already mentioned are the ability to transmit larger quantity of information in a very compact way. That's what visual do, that's what images do. Uh, interestingly, the ability to transmit this information about social collaboration, like in a hunting scene. And number three, the ability to represent things that do not exist, but that a society or a group of humans can find you know, important for their social cohesion or other purposes. Uh, for instance, sometime in this painting, you find totemic figures, half, half man, half animal, and it's not clear what they were. They were religious or they were other type of um, representation. Um, <clears throat> so the first couple of chapters in the book talk about this aesthetic reasoning, our brain perceived aesthetic stimuli and things like that. Uh, the core of the book is this. So this idea that there's a relationship between beauty and complexity. And the science that we mostly use for this part is a number of studies in uh, neuroscience uh, that shows uh, that, that our focus on how the brain perceives uh, art. And mostly using neuroimaging, uh, Ramachandran, uh, Samir Zeki, uh, Kandel, uh, they all show that this intriguing relationship between the ability of appreciating a beauty and our ability to resolve complex problems. And uh, again, I'm going to use some visuals here to give you uh, an example. So I have a series of paintings. Uh, this is a um, very minimalistic landscape by Carlo Carrà. Uh, then we have a more traditional landscape by John Constable. Um, Constable sorry. And this is a kind of traditional landscape uh, representation, especially in the 19th century. Uh, then we have a, a more enigmatic and complicated representation, like in this one. Uh, the fall of the rebel angels, in which you know these angels falling from from, the, from heaven becomes devils, and in this transformation they become like monstrous figures with a lot of combination of real and, uh, and uh, imaginary features. And then, of course, we have abstract art, and especially Pollock, you know, and th this is something that most people we find very very hard to to figure out what it is. A little bit like the game we played before. So if we put all these things on, on, a, on a real continuum from the very simple way of representing something to something that is really abstract or complicated, um, we uh, can learn a couple of things that psychology of perception uh, uh, found. So a, a very important uh, result was that on average, humans tend to prefer stimuli with moderate complexity. Not too much, not too little. So most people would try to uh, and, and this is, this is uh, not, I'm, I'm not considering artistic consideration here in terms of, you know, of course you might have different preferences, you might have different culture, uh, and so there are many other factors in place. But in terms of simplicity of representation, a number of elements in this kind of a, a aspect of complexity, most people would focus on the, on the middle uh, point of this scale. The second thing that we do, our brain does, when we are exposed to complexity is this. So we, we, when something is a little bit too complex, we try to simplify. When something is a little bit too simple for what we have to do, we try to complexify. And this is something that is, the first one is more under the attention of reasons of companies when they have to design a new product. It's all about simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. But in reality, we like some complexity as users. And uh, uh, Berlin uh, found out this empirically. A, a curve like this. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, you have complexity of the stimulus. And then people try to, uh, aesthetic pleasure, how much you like it, uh, is more or less, um, you know, peaks in the middle of that, of that continuum. Uh, interestingly, and independently, this was fi also found out by designers, like Don Norman or John Maeda. Uh, Norman say in his book, Living with Complexity, that users want or need some complexity. And uh, Maeda uh, introduced this, this trade-off between novelty and familiarity. In a design, we want a little bit of both. We want something that is uh, known, uh, comfortable, 
that uh, kind of doesn't scare us, but at the same time we want novelty, we want excitement, we want performance. So how do we combine these two things? Uh, what we did, uh, me and my colleague, was to connect this to a metric, uh, which is called an effective complexity. Uh, think of effective complexity as a form of good complexity, this type of intermediate complexity we want to achieve. And we found that this is very much connected with uh, the concept of elegance, uh, the way it has been considered in, uh, in design in some fields like computer science, uh, for instance, or other, or other design efforts. So it has a very similar behavior. So basically, effective complexity peaks when we have this mix of order and disorder, not too much information, not too little information. And the definition that he has, uh, that he provides, uh, Murray Gelman, a uh, Nobel Prize for, for physics, he, he is this one in words, and also there's a mathematical formulation of the concept. But we, in the book, we kind of um, simplify to this relationship, ratio between meaning and information, the, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. So, how we maximize meaning by minimizing information that we need to transfer. Um, so, uh, what, what, what the book actually proposed in terms of solution of this problem? How do we find that level of intermediate complexity we would like, we, we know from all of these studies being preferred? Uh, we don't know where it is, so most of the time we do by trial and error. We move uh, left or right depending if we want more complexity or we need to simplify. And uh, what we do in the book, we provide some guidance on how to do this in, a, in an actual way. So we identify the number of design um, heuristics. A group of these heuristics help to add variety. So when something that we have is too simple, when the design of our, I don't know, curriculum is not adequate to the challenge of the complexity of the professional uh, demand of skills and how the market is evolving, for instance, and things like that. We know we need to make that curriculum a little bit more, you know, sophisticated. Sometimes we are on the opposite side of the spectrum. Our curriculum is too much. We are overshooting the complexity of the problem, so we need to simplify it. So we move um, the other way around. Um, and then, you know, we identify some uh, general strategies for each of this uh, side of the spectrum by combining results from different studies. Uh, and so we try to distill this into these eight um, primitives. We call them uh, design strategies in the context of the book, but they, what they really are are problem-solving heuristics that we also kind of spontaneously or um, intuitively apply in our everyday life. So the way we, uh, uh, we have written the book is that basically each chapter, um, except the first two chapters, uh, the work as introduction, is dedicated to each of these strategies. Um, and then each chapter has this structure. I'm going to give you an example uh, of one of the strategies that we call splitting. Uh, splitting is, is a strategy that helps us to simplify a design. So when it, with too much information, we want to organize this information in a way that is more understandable. Um, and so we always start the chapter with an analysis of the strategy in the context of artistic, uh, an artistic uh, manufacture or work, or typically it's a painting. Uh, it's mostly about visual thinking in the book. Um, so this, uh, this is painted by Vermeer, uh, a building in the Netherlands in the 17th century. It's called Little Street. Um, so what, how, how we, we analyze this painting only by the, the, for, you know, from the purpose of, from the point of view of how information is organized visually. We are now, we are now talking about you know, the, the history behind the painting or the, the you know, what, what is relevant for history of art, uh, you know, we just focus on the way information is organized. And uh, so there's a grid here that creates some level of some, some patterning, right? And identify two levels. Splitting is really uh, about organizing information across different levels. And the ability for the observer to move across these levels to navigate the information this is hierarchically organized in this way. So you have an exterior, the first level is the exterior, it's the facade of the building. And then you have the interior, uh, which is you know, the, the room, the, the space inside the building. And then, more interestingly, you have a mechanism to navigate and move back and forth between these two levels, which in this case is a very simple device. It's an open door. Like, think of this painting with the doors closed. It would, have, it would be a little bit more trivial, right? 
he opened the door because I think probably, it's just a conjecture, for me one and us to experience that feeling, you know, when you, when you go, uh, you, you, you pass a building, especially if you're new to the place, you kind of wonder, you know, what is going on in this building? What is the, what, what life looks like? What, what people do in this building? So, you know, this curiosity, that is kind of natural. And it created this, this, this uh, movement to, uh, to satisfy that, that information need. Of course, for art, it's just, it's not practical utility, it's just there for our enjoyment. So the second part of the chapter, we apply this idea to some kind of uh, actual design. Sometimes it's a product, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's something else. Most of the time it's a product. Uh, so here, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with the Nest thermostat. This has been around for a while. Uh, Nest is now a famous company, smart home. Um, was bought by Google a few years ago. Um, so anyway, it started with a thermostat. <clears throat> And the thermostat, the Nest thermostat, I, I, you have here another thermostat. Uh, most thermostats look like that, the one on the right. Very complicated, very counterintuitive. We usually get lost. We don't know how to, f to fix this. You know, we, we try. We have to read a very long uh, uh, manual. We don't figure that out uh, and, and things like this. What, what about the Nest? The Nest is very simple. You don't need a manual to start with. Um, we uh, collected a number of interviews in which uh, these two designers, uh, Tony Fadell and uh, Peter uh, Bold, uh, came up with the idea. And they, uh, this, this um, stuck with me, what they said in one of these interviews. Uh, so we started with the basic observation that 99% of the time what we do with a the thermostat, we turn it up and down. Okay? So, okay. Uh, so, how can we second this natural movement is an understanding is, okay, what is the simplest form that help us to do this? A knob or a dial. Um, so they came up with a knob or a dial. And, and this is some kind of Pareto uh, principle at work. Because 80% of the use of something is based on 20% of its functionality. The rest we don't use it, right? However, however, that's not what makes the, the nest interesting. So this is only part of the story. Because what makes the nest interesting is the splitting strategy. Splitting means that information in the nest is organized at different levels, is accessible at different levels, and it's, it's left to the user the discretion to access that information uh, to the level that we want. So at the very simple level, we just want to do up and down. Okay, fine, heating works, temperature is fine, I don't need anything else. But um, the nest comes with a lot of sophistication, if you want. and. Uh, the idea is that basically you can hide complexity. You have to hide complexity. However, hiding complexity might not be a good idea. First of all, because complexity is there. Uh, we cannot ignore it. Even hitting a house has its complexity. You know, different environments, different needs in different environments, different people with different preferences, energy costs, um, seasons. It's, it's a very complex system if you want to automate that, for instance. Uh, so, yes, we, we want to hide complexity because we don't want to scare the users, but the problem is, how do I exit? I, I call this, how do I exit? Because when I enter into complexity because I need it, I also need to step back and go back to my simpler world because I don't have the time to deal with complexity all the time, right? So what they do, they invented a number of ways. Now, some of these are obvious, uh, like, for instance, creating an app where most of the sophisticated functions are dislocated so that if you want, to use the app to optimize whatever the eating system you can. Otherwise, you know, you might just ignore that an app even exists. Um, they created a very, um, they were among the first companies who focused on this idea of an unboxing experience. So this idea that, you know, the, the first time the customer meet with your product is fundamental in terms of emotional relevance and reaction. So if we scare the, the, the customer at that point, the user at that point, with a lot of complexity, you know, we, we're starting with the, with, the, with the wrong foot. So uh, simple, neat inboxing, a very easy way to connect this to, to, to your um, existing eating system and things like that. Um, that's another example. I probably am going to, uh, I don't know if I have time. Well, maybe quickly. So this, this is an example of, of a strategy that actually does the opposite. So the, 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 the splitting strategy help us to simplify a design. Uh, this one help us to add variety. So make it a little bit more complicated and interesting if you want. So again, we start with paintings. Uh, Modigliani is an example of emphasizing 
this idea that you can introduce some deliberate distortion, because of course he knew how to design a face, but he made these different faces because he wanted to emphasize something. And probably one aspect was, you know, the long neck is associated with uh, femininity or beauty, uh, uh, feminine beauty. Um, so caricature is the same trick. Like, you know, we have an average face that is nobody's face. And then our face is unique. And then, of course, this is done for mocking intent or for humor, whatever. But caricature are more, more interesting and more loyal, if you want, representation than that one in the middle because they really capture some feature uh, that makes that person that person, right? So when it comes to design, uh, one of my favorite stories is this car, the Jaguar E-Type. It's a vintage car. Um, uh, Enzo Ferrari, the founder of Ferrari, said that this was the most beautiful car ever designed. So I think we can trust this faith. Uh, so you can notice the shape of the car is very, very long, unnaturally long. And of course, this conveys immediately the sense of speed, the sense of agility uh, of this car, sport, uh, being a sport car, very fast car. So how that came to be? Well, they started, that was the evolution of a race, race, racing car, the D-type. Now, the D-type was that, uh, that shape for, for a, an engineering reason, because they had to fit a big engine in a car for racing. When they created a commercial one, there, there was no need for that powerful engine. Probably was not even allowed to have that kind of engine on a regular car. But nevertheless, they kept, they kept the shape. They could have made it shorter. They didn't. Uh, because they understood that you know, people would associate that shape with speed, with sport, with racing. And that was one of the reasons why they would buy that car. Also, you know, it's interesting to notice that when you emphasize something, you have to um, change other features in the car that kind of uh, serve that emphasis. For instance, the shape of the headlight, which is a little bit like elongated as well. Of course, you have to do that to second and serve the main emphasis. So uh, the book is, pre is pretty much uh, a long list of examples. Uh, we have, these are some. I'm not going to present, of course, them, just to give you a taste of what the variety of what you can find there. Uh, some are more contemporary. Some are more like traditional. Uh, sometimes it's also a couple of uh, advertising campaigns that we consider it like this one, Think Different or L'Oreal, um, because I'm worth it, uh, in the context of, wo of what we discuss in the book as elegant communication. We also have a couple of uh, cases on elegant organizations. Uh, Olivetti was an Italian company that uh, pioneered this idea of introducing beauty, not just in products, but also in the way they manage the company itself, and especially people. Uh, and it was very productive. They, they created the first desktop computer in the world, the Programma uh, 101, 101, which is the one in the middle. Uh, Squad um, is a methodology that Spotify used to, to uh, leverage creativity of, of its developers. And there are other examples, uh, also architecture, places, uh, in, uh, exterior or interior. Um, and uh, the book is actually very rich of visual. Uh, we have. I think it's, I counted them, one in 41 pictures. It was a lot of work just to get the copyright and everything. Um, and not to mention you know, the quality. And, and this, don't do a visual book. That's <laughs> my, my, my advice. Uh, the, the exercises, this is actually uh, uh, free. Um, I mean, you don't have to buy the book to use this exercise. They are on the Bloomsbury website. I recommend you to give it a look if you want, especially if you teach a class on creativity and innovation, because uh, some of this. Uh, are really creativity exercises that you can use in your classes, regardless of whether you know uh, uh, it's uh, related to the book or not. And of course, there's a little bit of uh, the science of. Uh, so we try to we did our best to provide a little bit of evidence from existing studies that the strategy, the heuristic, works and why it works. Um, so the book is out. We managed the last minute to to get it. Uh, there's been a little bit of logistic complication for reasons that you can imagine including, you know, pandemic, war, and Brexit, the, 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 the publishers based in London. So they told me, you know, we are sorry, we're doing our best. Uh, so it's not yet available in the United States. The launch has been postponed to the end of May. But thanks to Katya and Christine uh, and the publisher, we, we, you know, tried to do the, their best. And you know, we, got, we got the copies and um, very happy about it. So um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, we also have a blog, uh, in case you, you want to follow me there, uh, which we publish things from the books a little bit and other reflections on this idea of elegance in design. 
And uh, again, thanks a lot for listening to me. And uh, if there is any question, if we have time, I'd be happy to. Yes, Luca, we will take uh, only two questions because we will move quickly into the panel and continue to digest this as, as we move forward with the conversation. But I wanted, to, if anybody has a burning question, um, please use this mic or over there. I do have one while you think about your question. Um, Gestalt theory was before this, uh, and yet you're connecting it with beauty. Why wasn't Gestalt enough? Um, what, what's new that you're bringing with this notion of tying it to beauty? Well, I think what, what we did was to put together a number of pieces um, uh, from different fields. And so the first thing is this relationship between beauty and complexity and how that can, can be applied to design. So the idea that beauty is not just something ornamental or something uh, even functional to certain purposes, but it's something that at a very higher level help us to think to analyze information when it's structured in ways that are not obvious. Number two um, is the way to quantify this. Now in the book, the book is, not, is, is written for a larger audience. We have some papers in which we have tried to use that metric, effective complexity, uh, in a more um, rigorous and mathematical way, uh, studying interfaces. Uh, and basically, we found out you know, that it predicts, effective complexity predicts things like aesthetic pleasure, usability, uh, and so when a design is effectively complex, which in, in, in our language is elegant, combining this mix of order and disorder, it, it works better in terms of what the users uh, do with it and how they perceive it. That's good. Do we have one more question? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Cesar Bandera. Gracias. Saludos, Luca. Um, actually, on the issue of Gestalt, so uh, um, you know, visual attention, you know, eye motion is, is, you know, all the research that's going on in that, that this perception is, is not static from an image, but we tend to build it from saccades. Um, and, and user interfaces now aren't just how do we set up a website, but how, actually what you were saying, how, how, how one navigates through complexity. Um, how, how can somebody who is designing a, a, a product or an interface using you know, visual attention principles, you know, time, and a time axis in their design, how can they use uh, your findings? So in, in two ways, so if, uh, first of all in the book we mention a in a couple of instances this, this technology that can be used for that purpose is eye tracking. So it's basically smart glasses connected to a computer and you give these glasses to a user and the user you know, look at something and then you can trace uh, where attention goes and now the gaze moves across the image. And from that you can learn a number of things on you know, what they consider important, how they, if that exploration is driven by something um, uh, like some, some kind of logic or some, some kind of purpose or if the user get lost, for instance. If, you, if, you, if these spots are all over the places, that's probably not a good sign. So f from the empirical point of view, this is one, one possibility. And then from the methodological point of view, the idea is that uh, basically uh, this combines a little bit with design thinking. So the idea that you have to use this principle, you can use this principle to combine, to create multiple instances of the same interfaces while being guided by this principle. For instance, there's too much symmetry, let's try to break the symmetry. Or um, there's no uh, obvious visual center in an image, maybe we, we need to create one. Or maybe there are more that are competing between them, but are in, not in a good way. So all of these strategies actually give you ideas of what to change on a very general level on the, on the interface. And then, you, of course, you have to experiment, you have to measure so that uh, you, you can have evidence that it really works. But it should, if the theory is correct, uh, and it's not our theory most of the time, like for instance, the theory of visual centers, uh, the stone of studies, and it should work. So if you find a good visual center, you know, you have, you have a key to redesign your interface, for instance, in, an, in a novel way. Thank you. So I would now ask uh, if I can follow directions so that you, you sit in this part of the table, and I would like to invite my colleagues here in the front row. Um, uh, Dean Martinelli, Dean Robinson, Mark Yushak, 
and Edrex Fontanilla to join us in a panel. So uh, we'll continue from here. Thank you. Perfect. And um, I will ask my colleagues to start with a little bit of what we do here at Sydney Hall University as well and, uh, um, and introducing our speakers. But one thing that we wanted to do now is continue to think about applications. And Luca, you already mentioned the one when you said if you want to teach a course in creativity and innovation, this could be a useful framework uh, for you to use. Um, so what ideas, what can we use this and other ideas to, to build um, the future of some fields and how we have to rethink about fields and what are we doing and what we would like to know about what others are doing. So I'll pass it next to my colleagues from Sinaloa University and we will then do an introduction of our speakers. Thank you. Or you can use that one. Great. Good afternoon. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Joseph Martinelli. I'm the interim dean in the College of Education and Human Services. Uh, and right now, it's a pleasure to meet you. I, I went through your book. I have so many questions. And I love that you have Frank Lloyd Wright up there if you get a chance. Have you ever been to Falling Water? Um, no. Oh, it's not too far in Pennsylvania. You will love it. <laughs> I, I was going and then called it up and I then oh, they closed it. And, yeah, yeah. They, I've been there twice. It's amazing. It's an amazing mix of nature, aesthetic, it's what it is. Um, so, a little bit about my background, what we're doing now, and how we fit in here in the College of Ed. Uh, the College of Ed, along with the College of uh, Arts and Calm, we're in the middle of a new unit redesign where we're bringing both these units together. Uh, my background in the College of Ed, I also uh, have run, and I'm part of the Instructional Design and Technology. I have a, a major interest in creativity, uh, I've presented on RE creating consumers or creators with technology uh, and so forth. And this is fascinating, everything that's in here. It's a great panel. So my job today in our program, and you've given me ideas, by the way. I think I will integrate this book with one of my faculty members, um, is to introduce Mark. He calls me, just call him Dr. Mark, right? Professor Mark. He says, Makes I cannot sense. say his last name. Um, he said, all my students call me Professor Mark, and that's Mark Jizak. They get close? Yeah. Yeah, I got good. Uh, from assistant professor in international communication at St. John's in New York. Um, as I was told, you know, I got opportunity to introduce Mark. I always, if you know my background, I have a background in journalism, so I like to look a little bit of research, you know, and I wanted to see a little bit about Mark. And then I looked at the bio, and so if I embarrass you a little bit, don't be mad at me. It's all, it's all good stuff. Um, his standard bio, his area of research is the study of media and innovation. And you all know at Seton Hall, we are currently in the seeds of innovation. So it's a timely statement. Um, he's an advisor on human rights technology for the Vatican Mission to the United Nations. Uh, I found an interesting note that's not on here, and it's just through discussions with Mark. He has studied in, in India, mm -hmm. and um, he also, and I'm going to jump around, has an amazing book on Amazon. This is for Mary Balkan out there, called The Hymn of the Avatar. It's a book on poetry. So you may want to check that out. I've checked that out myself. Uh, Mark is interested in inventions, problem solving, information sourcing, problem analysis, knowledge creation processes, fuzzy metrics as opposed to unfuzzy metrics, innovation management, and the sociology of media and applied epistemology. So that's, that's, that's a good statement, Mark. Has, which means he's a Renaissance man. Okay, that's essentially what that means, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, he's agreeing with me. He's learned. Professor Mark <laughs> holds a doctorate from Columbia University in Education with a cross-specialization in organizational innovation and cognition. It's really a cool background if you dig into what he's done. Um, he is a published author, which we spoke about. It. Uh, internationally respected scholar, has spoken throughout the world. He's been quoted in the New York Times, Forbes, and he has consulted with Fortune 100 directors and principals. Um, interestingly, he has taught courses in mass comm, which I have taught courses in mass comm, multimedia communications, new media, uh, international comm in Europe. 
uh, media and calm research. He's just a calm media culture and society. Uh, amazing list of classes that he's taught. He has uh, three books out there right now available on Amazon. Remember, you go to Amazon and look them up. Uh, one is called Solarization, which is his, uh, uh, I want to say it's a 2010 book, I believe, on uh, economic development of the solar system as an alternative energy to violence-prone globalization program. Interesting, available to download. Uh, his other one that I really was fascinated by, which I, I, I purchased today from my Kindle. I'm a Kindle person. Mary Balkan does not like it that I read Kindle. I'm sorry. Um, is Empowering Innovators. Uh, his Empowering Innovators is a collection of essays that focuses on the management of innovation. As I tie that word in again, innovation, uh, and I did a quick skim through. And I, Do you mind if I read a quote from your book? Don't mind. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> he has a, a quote that stuck out to me this morning. And, I, and if you know me, I go through, and um, as someone who was a certified English, I use stickies. So I grabbed this quote out there, and I think this is very appropriate, Renee, to what we're going in right now. Uh, fear and naivete must work together, side by side, to convert the irrational into the rational and to create new knowledge that can be applied to new technologies. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's really applicable in what we're doing now with change. And, and that stuck, you know, my, I'll probably print that out and put that on my wall. Uh, and it stuck out to me that I think is very interesting as we, people do not embrace change. And, and that's what I wanted to introduce you. I've probably spoken far too long. Uh, and again, well, I drop in the seat hall. And he had, oh, iced coffee. If anybody knows any good iced coffees, please give him some names. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was all I had to say at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I pass this on to Dean Robinson. Thank you, Dean Martinelli. Much appreciated. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you today. And thanks for the opportunity to engage a little bit about what we are doing. Thank you. How polite. We also have matching shoes, if you didn't notice. We didn't even it's coordinate true. that. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to visit with all of you today and talk a little bit about what we've been doing. And I think that our speakers here today have had us thinking quite a bit. We first had the opportunity to interact with um, our colleagues last week. And since that time, I've been thinking a lot about this concept of design. Um, I'm the interim dean of the College of Communication and the Arts. We are a complex organization. We're an organization, a unit that is comprised of teachers and scholars, practitioners, artists, theorists, who coexist and figure out the best ways in which we can explore concepts of expression. So if you want to know why art history or music or public relations or journalism or communication or media um, studies or any of our other wide swath of courses live in our area, it's because we are expressive. And we believe in looking at the human experience and the implications of that experience as expressed through different messaging. Now that said, our conversation last week about design and our conversation really here today has a lot to do with what is, is that we see as impactful, what is change, and how do we navigate that? And when we look about seeds of innovation and we think about the strategic plan, design is through that entire document. And if you haven't had a chance to think about it in that way, I would encourage you to, because everything that we're doing here at Seton Hall currently is requiring us to redesign, from advising, the student experience, to career readiness, to our colleges and schools, to the way our disciplines interface. So the conversation here today is to help us jumpstart that and think about ways in which we can further implement things in the College of Communication and the Arts, the College of Education and Human Services, and our broader campus. I will share with you from the Communication and the Arts perspective some things that we've been doing that have challenged us on the design front and that I think are really good spaces and places and schools of thought. Um, one of the big takeaways that we have had is the chance to redesign classroom spaces, instructional spaces, indoor and outdoor spaces. We've had a chance to take on a major renovation of our TV studio. We're looking at ways in which we can infuse not only more technology, but how can we change that space so students experience media creation differently. That's also challenging us to think about our classroom spaces, which now we're preferring something more like creative spaces. 
something you probably read a little bit about. And they're starting to think about why a classroom isn't a classroom anymore, because now we're content consumers and creators. So how can we then come together from different disciplines to enhance that? I think another thing we're looking at is the role of theater. We have a major renovation going on now in our university center that's allowing our theater to become showcased even more so. So how is the human experience depicted in theater? And what can we learn from education? What can we learn from science? What can we learn from anthropologists, et cetera, that would allow us to think about how to recreate and better understand human experience? We also have projects going on currently with WSOU, some upgrades there, thinking about how all of this is going to change and better prepare our student experience. So we've been very fortunate. And while some people see uh, Seeds of Innovation and this interesting partnership that we're moving towards as a challenge, we actually see it as an opportunity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later today. I want to share with you um, an opportunity that I've been really excited about since last week in learning more about our impact talks and about our speakers. But we have a colleague with us here today that is equally as impressive as my colleague here to the left. What's brilliant about this are all the thinkers here that are messy in nature by way of our fields. And if you're a really good instructor, you're a little messy, because that's how it works. It's about experimentation, right? So we're joined by Edric Spontanella here today. And I want to share a few things about um, Edric. One, he's deeply passionate. And he's curious, which I think is a hallmark of a really good educator, too. Someone that's not afraid to blur lines and test boundaries and think about the implications of that. I think something that's very important is he's an experimental filmmaker. I want to focus on that experimental filmmaker part. Experimental, which is something I think if you're in design and you're thinking through challenges and problems and opportunities, you tend to have to be a little bit of an experimentalist. He also believes in creative practice. He's an artist who actually fuses sculptural and computational methods. Right? Think about that. Sculpture and computational methods and explores perception, materiality, and temporality. So what you're probably starting to wonder is where do those things intersect? How does that work and what does that create? He researches how the study of human psychology and cognition can inform the approaches in experimental media. And how do we know what students are doing and how does that shape their mind and their learning? So today we're going to have an opportunity to visit with him and the work that he's been doing in gaming and emerging media, design work, and how that influences what we do with media and the education of our students. Again, you're probably starting to wonder, hmm, that com arts and ed human service thing may not be a bad idea, right? Ed Ricks. Thank you very much. Um, I think Mark Is it our chance to speak? Yeah. Yes. Well, then you go first. <laughs> he's already said he's done. He said thank you. <laughs> yeah, you go first. Really? Yeah, by all means. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Dean Robinson, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, I have to say it is a real privilege and honor to be part of uh, Dr. Ian Doley's uh, book announcement. And I am tickled happy to be able to see uh, and be in the same room with Dr. Passerina once again. Um, as Dean Robinson sa said, I'm a new media artist, first and foremost. Um, but the component of my creative practice that I want to emphasize today is that so much of my intellectual identity hinges on interdisciplinary collaboration. Right? So, um, you know, my degrees are in the arts, um, visual art, uh, music, and literary arts, um, but I have enjoyed uh, close to two decades now a collaborative exploration with someone who uh, primarily identifies as a neuroscientist. And so the sculpture that we create explores the different ontological states uh, between um, digital art object right, and, and physical object in the hopes that by merging the two, we might explore the materiality of something that you can't necessarily feel, you know, or maybe take a physical object and have it in inherit the mutable characteristics of the digital correlate. Basically, those are big words to describe the fact that we're playing with the old and the new, marrying the two to create uh, unique experiences. And as Dean Robinson said, you know, we're, um, bringing to bear 
uh, what we know about how we see the world, how we perceive the world to inform our creative practice. But at the end of the day, what I always feel vulnerable about is, you know, after giving an artist, artist talk, someone in the audience asks, well, Edrix, are you measuring, you know, galvanic skin response? You know, where does that work, you know, fall within the veridicality scale, right? And I can't help but look to my collaborator and say, oh my gosh, Dr. Sultan, what, wait, what? What are we doing? <laughs> you know, what's our sample size? Is this a legitimate endeavor? Right? Um, and so I feel vulnerable. You know, we look to, you know, there's some code switching involved, right? In the word choice that we use, the language that we invoke um, to trigger the right associations when we target specific juried publications. Uh, what am I invested in? Does the work make an impact? You know, if social change and social service happens one person at a time, Will someone be uh, positively affected by this endeavor? So um, I'm going to just cite one collaborative endeavor um, in the hopes that it can serve as a springboard for discussion later on, and then I'll pass the torch. Um, so one collaboration um, that I've enjoyed is with uh, Dr. Nava Silton, who is a scholar in developmental psychology. And so we create um, virtual reality simulations um, to help young people develop uh, a positive view of others who have an atypical perceptual experience of the world. You know, those who have a hypersensitivity to certain visuals or have a different learning style, so on and so forth. And so you can imagine, um, you know, if, if you put on a mask, and you take on the role of a character in one of Nava's, um, the universe that she created called Real Abilities, right? So you have Melody who um, has low vision, but she has perfect pitch, right? And so you engage in these in-class classroom activities through the eyes of Melody. Um, at the end of the day, a young person might momentarily take the place of, of some, you know, be in the place of in someone else's shoes. And in that moment, they might start to develop an understanding, um, which is a precursor of cognitive empathy. And so I will leave the questions about veridicality or galvanic skin responses and sample sizes to Dr. Silton. Um, because I'm primarily focused in, on a tool being yet another entry in the toolkit that will help young people grow to be incredible contributors to, to the world. Um, so this is where I'll end um, with, with this thought. Um, gosh, I've been doing this for a couple of decades. Um, I'm happy to, and relieved to say that I'm a tenured faculty member, right? But even now, I'm, I still feel vulnerable about interdisciplinary practice because of the questions, fair questions, about the rigor of our scholarly pursuits because we are traversing uh, disciplinary lines. So um, there's a fair amount of trust, of acceptance of vulnerability in negotiating those disciplinary lines. But if it means then that we can accomplish more together, then it's a worthwhile endeavor. So with that, I will pass the torch to my good buddy, Mark. I finally have more to say. <laughs> so, I was thinking about the, uh, the steps that Luca articulates in the book. Uh, and I wanted to talk about a very weird and seemingly irrelevant but important distinction and that distinction is between joining and merging, mm -hmm. and how these two things look similar, but are not the same. And I can speak about it from my own personal experience, and I think that the consequences of that experience have informed for me, uh, to a very high degree, the significance of the difference in those two words. Uh, when I was doing my own doctorate, uh, 
I wanted to do an interdisciplinary doctoral degree at Columbia. And I went to the dean, I went to my advisors, and I said, well, I want to do an interdisciplinary doctorate. You guys have that program option, let me do it. And they said, okay, you can do it. And I didn't realize that we both used the same word, but it meant different things. <laughs> now, that distinction is actually very important because when they said the word interdisciplinary, they meant bidisciplinary. They meant that I was majoring in field A and minoring in field B, or I was taking field A and using models from field B. And that's not what I wanted to do, and we had a lot of fights. I spent a lot of time in the dean's office arguing with the dean. He and I became friends, but only after a while. But what happened is that there was a radical distinction between a bidisciplinary doctoral degree and a true interdisciplinary doctoral degree. I wasn't interested in studying two fields. I was interested in solving a problem. And solving that problem or teaching myself a set of tools to solve that problem required me dipping my toes into many fields because that problem hadn't been well solved yet because if it had been solved, I wouldn't have to study it. And the problem I was looking at was the question of how we create knowledge in institutions and how we manage that process. And I didn't want to do a PhD in business because I wasn't interested in funding innovation and I wasn't interested in looking at the financial side of business cycles. I was interested in what happens in the person's head. What happens in the head of the employee that all of a sudden makes them a more creative person. And I couldn't answer that question only through business. I couldn't answer it only through education. I couldn't answer it only through psychology. And I had to actually fight with my advisors, fight with the dean, and I was happy to do it because that's my personality. But I ended up being able to do what I wanted to do. And for me, it was a very powerful lesson in the difference between joining and merging, and its consequences on the structure of a discipline itself. Mm -hmm. And what I understood is that, for example, if you want to merge two fields together, right, merging them together is different than joining them together. A joining is simply a box you put them into. A merging is a different type of integration where the integration has fundamentally different outcomes in mind, and those outcomes require radically different approaches to the structure of the discipline itself. Now, I remember having uh, a number of conversations about this uniquely from the perspective of education and media because I'm a professor of media, but I have a doctorate in education. And I come into both fields with a unique lens. And I asked a very simple question, which I think if we can't answer that question, that's actually a good thing. And the question is, as two examples, I can give you probably dozens more, right? Is the University of Phoenix a media company or an education company? Is National Geographic Channel a media company or an education company, right? And the more I dig into the way that we've restructured the interactive world, the more I begin to realize that I don't have good answers. But I wanted to open this session by drawing on Luca's <laughs> work on segmentation and on the fundamental principles of design because I think that that distinction, because you talk about symmetry, you talk about these ways that we simplify or complexify the world around us. From my own personal experience, I understood that very, very slight differences in meaning have huge differences in outcome. And I felt that this distinction between joining and merging was a great place to start. It was both a relative design principle, but also probably a very timely discussion. Thank you. You just reminded me of our fights on, I want to teach a course with Dr. Seuss, and I said, could you please not put Dr. Seuss in the name yes. of the course? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. can, I, can I just say this? I'm sorry. It, it, it was, I, I want to thank Dean Passerini, and I, Provost Passerini, 
to me, Dean Passerini, and I want to thank Professor Montero, who's sitting quietly and watching me with horror. Um, several years ago, I asked then Dean Passerini um, if I could teach a master's degree class international com on Dr. Seuss. And I made my case, and I was allowed to do it, but it took a while. But ultimately, I was able to teach a class, and the class was called Dr. Seuss and Global Media Ethics. And it was a co-reading seminar where we took the different levels of co-messaging between classical Seuss texts and the commentaries or relevant books of their time. So in one week, students read, for example, The Lorax from Dr. Seuss, but they co-read it by also reading Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which came out at the same time. We read Horton Hears a Who, which is, of course, an allegory about the atom bomb, along with John Hershey's Hiroshima. And the question was, how do students come to understand these multiple levels of expressiveness at different audiences and the power of messaging in those vastly different formats? And it was an incredibly successful class. I'm very thankful for the chance to bring Seuss into the classroom. The funniest thing was watching my graduate students who have children steal their kids' Seuss books for class. Like, I need this, you don't need the Lorax, I really need it now. So, and, thank and, you. And this has nothing to do with the other <laughs> fight on, I want to open a journal on space archaeology. Yeah, and no I'm kidding. Like, How many readers there are there? <laughs> uh, but let's stay on the practical. And let's go back to her art, because uh, Mike and Etrex and, and Luke and everybody always are out there in space. And I wanted to bring. Um, someone who helps us get things done at this university, uh, Paul Fisher, to give us also an update on how he's supporting a lot of our ambitions on doing the new things through technology and then guiding us on the next steps of our interaction. Thank you. Well, I'm glad she said it. That was deep and I'm not that deep. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. Um, so I'm Paul Fisher, I'm the Associate Chief Information Officer at the University and also the Director of our Teaching and Learning Technology Center. I'm excited to be part of the program and, and, and meet our guests. There's a couple things um, I can unpack just from, from the talk. Um, the very first thing is that bird did a lot more for a date than I did for my oh. 19th wedding anniversary <laughs> yesterday. Uh, so I'm glad my wife isn't in the room. I don't, I don't see her here, that's, so that, that's good for me. Um, but really the, the, the takeaway that I got from most of these things is that we're all designers, we all need to be designers, and we need to teach our students to be designers. So again, going from that depth to the less, less deep um, talk, to, to me that translates to 21st century skills. Um, and those tw these 21st century skills are important for our faculty and they're, they're most important for our students and their future success. Um, and not just the ability to use tools to get at things like elegant design and, and ultimately elegantly design the things, um, but, but being a designer regardless of the discipline that we're in or the job that we do on campus, right? So, whether, uh, imagine if we approach developing an online course from the thermostat example, right? And we're looking at a Blackboard class like the clunky thermostat, but somehow we got to the Nest thermostat with our online courses, right? Like that's the sort of concepts that we need to start to start working on. Um, and, and even from an assignment perspective and, and getting our students to think that way and use digital tools in those ways so that we're, we're not always just reading a paper and grading a paper and sending it back, but we're getting digital media aspects and artifacts in doing those things. Um, so we need to teach them how to do those things for us and we need to teach them how to use those tools for when they get out into the workforce. But not just use them, but to discern what the best tool to get the job done is and how to adapt from project to project because the tool I used on project one might not be the tool I need to use for project two. Now we call our students digital natives. I, I'd use an explicative but I won't right now. Um, <laughs> I, I think our students are not afraid of technology like many of us were when it first came onto the scene. They'll use it, they'll jump in if they want to. There's a thousand times a week that goes by where my kids will tell me, Dad, I need help on this. And I'll tell them, well, pretend it's Snapchat, because I didn't teach you how to use that. Um, and, and they ultimately get to it. So, so you know, part of what I want to do is sort of um, take us from this uh, concept that we all need to be designers and, and, and we need to help our, 
our students become diviner, designers and, and talk about some very real things that we're doing at the university and, and plan to do as we go forward. So the university's strategic plan calls for the development of really a 21st century living and learning environment. The evidence of that plan's launch is obvious on the green when you look at the renovation of the university center where our students will spend a whole lot of time with a whole lot of new technology and, uh, and the renovation of Bowen Hall. Uh, which is happening as we speak. So from the living perspective, um, we could see the plan really take its shape. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes to highlight some of the projects that aren't so visible yet, uh, but that address the digital learning environment and that will allow our students and our faculty to become these designers and, and both utilize uh, tools to, to help them use the aesthetic principles that Luca was talking about to, to get at um, much better products. So Harvest Our Treasures, uh, goal three, specifically calls for spaces and experience where students can practice what they learn in the classroom. And with, with the, those goals in mind, we are in the final stages of opening a broadcast room that's been incorporated into the eSports facility in Jubilee Hall. Here, students in sports media and broadcasting might call their first match, cut highlight reels of games, or conduct interviews of our championship teams. Just a small plug, two championship teams this season. Um, we're in the planning stages of outfitting a learning space that will uh, simulate elementary and secondary education classrooms where future teachers can practice their lessons and their plans and experiment with technology in a low stakes environment before they ever get in front of live students. You know, we, we push them out there sometimes into the deep end of the pool. Perhaps my favorite project, and I think Dean Bushman left so this joke will go aside, it will, it wouldn't go over as well, but it's, it's funny that I call it my favorite project because I'm working with him a lot. Um, <laughs> it, most people get that. Um, but really, it, it could be the most impactful project that we have going on, going on right now that impacts the entire community. And that's really a project to transform the library and the TLT Center from a space perspective um, to ensure that we provide academic resources, space, and technology that students need to reach their academic goals. This might be the biggest investment we'll make in the library and technology in the last 25 years. Modern study rooms with built-in technology, the possibility of 24-hour zones so our students are doing work when and when they need to, when they feel most comfortable. With available technology like 3D printers, virtual reality creation rooms, audio booths for podcast creations, a schedulable studio for recording on-demand videos, all in use either to teach or to show a learning outcome. Um, very specifically, having support staff co-located in that space to help students and faculty incorporate these activities in their teaching and learning objectives. So the campus-wide conversation will start today. Um, we'll continue this through the next academic year in, in uh, collaboration with our Teaching, Learning, and Technology Roundtable. My co-chair, Mike Taylor, is in the audience. Some of our co-chairs of our committees are, are here, too. Um, on May 5th, we'll begin the investigation of the possibility of becoming an Adobe Creative Campus. Hopefully you've all seen the announcement that we sent out yesterday that on May 5th, don't get your hopes up yet, guys. We have a lot to talk about. I saw lots of reaction off to my left, right, right in front of me. Uh, and I'm glad you're excited, I'm excited too. Um, so on, on May 5th, we'll, we'll bring an evangelist from Adobe. He's a professor of English from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and we'll start the conversation about providing those, what we think of as foundational tools into being designers um, and putting in the hands of every student and, and faculty member. What we wanna do now over the next 30 minutes, uh, first we wanna grab, we want everybody to grab lunch, but our, um, our panelists and, and, our, and our deans um, are each going to be at a table in the back. And there are three questions that we're going to address at each table. So I guess from my left to the right, we'll call it one, two, three. So um, um, the, the three questions are, how do we help each other be innovative within our specific discipline? And, and we, Edric has talked about that. How do we define our space and environment to align and support our program objectives? And how do we manifest the collaborative experience amongst the different disciplines? So our goal today is to brainstorm on how we could support our teaching and learning goals, leverage our guests' experiences and expertise to achieve the success that we need at Seton Hall. Um, so if everybody will grab some lunch and then make your way to one of the tables, 
we can move chairs around. We'll, we'll keep it um, very informal. And we want to spend the next 30 minutes sort of unpacking one of those questions at each table. Your, the, our, our guests all know which question they're supposed to address. So, um, But it, one is about innovation within a specific discipline. Two is about space and environment. And three is about collaborative experiences among disciplines. Um, so we'll spend about 30 minutes having that conversation with our experts and our guests. Um, and then we're going to report back. So someone at the table will probably be asked to be a speaker. Um, so, so be prepared. Thank you. I, I, hold on. Before okay. we break, um, as, as you do grab your lunch, we have also arranged for Luca. You're going to oh, go right. lunch free today to sign the book if you like to. We have arranged no for, for that table that. So before you line up, um, we will indulge uh, your courtesy to. It's always, I always like to read a book that has been signed by the author. So <laughs> please take your book and, and, uh, and let's have that. Thank you. Thank you. I know, exactly. We have to work for it.